Welcome to Howard University School of Law. My name is Okemer Christian Dark, and I'm the interim dean for Howard Law School. We are truly delighted to have this amazing panel of speakers to talk about in a very important and should be continuously timely issue involving the Cuban Five. And this program, of course, asks the question, justice or injustice? And we'll see where you fall after this wonderful discussion. Howard Law School is in its 143rd year. And it has produced many fine lawyers, uh, over the years, as, as all of you know, and we're, of course, continuing to do that good work. There is a uh, saying that we share with uh, first-year law students the minute they walk in the door. And this particular phrase uh, that we share with them is really a way for us to let them know this is what Howard is about. Former Dean Charles Hamilton Houston would say that a lawyer is either a parasite on society or a social engineer. We're developing social engineers. But what is a social engineer? And he said, he has said that a social engineer is a highly skilled, perceptive, sensitive lawyer who understands the Constitution of the United States and knows how to explore its uses in solving the problems of local communities and in bettering the conditions of underprivileged citizens. So he has, in talking about a social engineer, when we talk to our students about a social engineer, is that a social engineer, by definition, was to be and is to be the mouthpiece of the weak and a sentinel guarding against wrong. So this program fits quite well into our educational program because it gives us an opportunity to talk about some wrongs, to talk about how might you, as a lawyer, address issues that you're going to be hearing about, and in fact, how some of these lawyers, activists, have, and teacher scholars, have addressed the issues presented regarding the Cuban file. So, I'm only going to give you this little instruction. It's nice. Enjoy yourself with the, the conversation. If you have cell phones, which most of you do, <laughs> turn them off. Please turn them off. We don't want to be distracted. Our first speaker will be Gloria LaRiva. Now you have a program that provides just a synopsis, a tiny synopsis of the backgrounds of our presenters. But Gloria Lavita Lariva is the coordinator of the National Committee to Free the Cuban Five. And I will say to you that she uh, deserves considerable credit for the work for all, the work in putting together this panel. She has been a wonderful partner with us. And we are, uh, I just want to uh, acknowledge and give her credit for the fine work that she's done on this program. So, Gloria. Sisters and brothers, on behalf of those of us involved in seeking justice for the Cuban Five, we thank Dean Okemer Dart and Howard University Law School for hosting this important panel, especially in this time of the Cuban Five's current habeas corpus appeals. To the students of Howard Law School, 
It is heartening to know, and we salute you, for actively being involved in defending affirmative action before the Supreme Court, before the case that is now there. As Dean of the Law School in 2007, Dr. Kurt Schmoke hosted the first forum on the Cuban Five. In that event, Mr. Leonard Weinglass, the famed civil rights attorney who was part of the appeals team, presented his case right here in the moot courtroom. Very sadly, Mr. Weinglass died last year. His talk that evening remains, I believe, the clearest and most convincing argument for the freedom of the Cuban Five. Despite being one of the longest trials at the time in U.S. history, and despite their status as national heroes in the country of Cuba, the Cuban Five are not widely known in the United States even though it is the U.S. government that prosecuted them and has held them in prison for 14 years. Who are these men? The Cuban Five are five Cuban nationals who entered the United States, specifically Miami, starting in 1990, to engage in an operation of preventing terrorist attacks against their people of Cuba. They were completely unarmed. They never had a weapon. Now, in the U.S., on September 11, 2001, the people of the U.S. experienced the terror of terrorism with the Twin Towers bombing that killed almost 3,000 people. But what most Americans don't know is that the Cuban people have suffered terrorism for 50 years. For those five decades, hundreds of terrorist attacks have been carried out against Cuba by extremist groups in Miami groups that are made up of Cuban-American right-wingers, with funding and arms from the CIA and the impunity granted to them by the Miami and the U.S. authorities, terrorist organizations such as Alpha 66, Omega 7, the armed wing of the Cuban-American National Foundation, Brothers to the Rescue, and dozens of others have bombed, assassinated, used biological warfare against the people of Cuba to try to destabilize the Cuban Revolution since its dawn in 1959. It's important to know this to understand the mission of the Cuban Five. After the Cuban Revolution, thousands of right-wing Cuban exiles came into Miami, and an estimated 4,000 of them were trained by the CIA in sabotage, bombings, basically terrorism. And one of the most, tori most notorious crimes of these terrorists was that of the airline bombing in 1976. On October 6 of that year, two of the most notorious Cuban-American terrorists, Luis Posada Camiles and Orlando Bosch, engineered that a Cuban airliner would be bombed, and 73 people died on that plane. To this day, Luis Posada Carriles lives a free man in Miami. But the Cuban Five, who were peacefully stopping that terrorism and trying to, are in U.S. prison. The men are Gerardo Hernandez, Ramon Abanino, Antonio Guerrero, Fernando Gonzalez, and Rene Gonzalez was released last year in October, but the court has refused to allow him to return home to his family in Cuba ordering him to spend another unjust three years of probation in the United States. In the late 1990s, there were a series of bombings in Cuban hotels, and one Italian tourist was murdered in one of those bombings. In, excuse me, 1997. And in June 1998, three months before the Cuban Five were arrested, Cuba asked for collaboration, cooperation with the U.S. authorities to stop this terrorism and other plots that they were aware of. The FBI sent a team of officials to Cuba in June 1998. Cuba handed over to them hundreds of documents proving the plots and evidence of these terrorist plans in Miami. The FBI said, thank you, we'll get back to you. Three months later, instead of detaining the terrorists, uh, based on this evidence, 
In the dawn hours of September 12, 1998, the FBI broke into the homes of the Cuban Five in Miami and Tampa and arrested them, and they've been behind bars ever since. <coughs> they were charged with 26 federal counts, including failure to register as foreign agents with the U.S. Attorney General, using false documents. But three major counts stand out, involving conspiracy charges. Conspiracy is a favorite tool of prosecutors used by the U.S. government in politically motivated cases. And with the conspiracy charge, the crime needs not be committed, nor even evidence produced. A defendant can simply be accused of intent to commit a crime in the future. Three of the five, Hernandez, Lavanino, and Guerrero, were charged with conspiracy to commit espionage. They never committed espionage, nor intended to, nor was the U.S. their target. They were monitoring the actions of the Miami terrorists, not the U.S. government. Yes, this, yet despite the prosecution's own admission that not one page of evidence um, existed in the men's possession to prove espionage, the three were convicted of espionage conspiracy and received life sentences. Later, three years ago, two of them had their sentences reduced to 22 years and 30 years. But Gerardo Hernandez remains with life. The other major charge against Gerardo Hernandez again, known as Count Three, was leveled against him in conspiracy to commit murder. This indictment came seven months after the five's arrest. The murder conspiracy indictment falsely linked him to the February 24, 1996 shoot down by the Cuban government of two planes by Brothers to the Rescue. Who was Brothers to the Rescue? I need to give you a little information. This is very critical because Gerardo Hernandez, unless these convictions are overturned, would die in prison. And this is a man who saved people's lives, who never harmed anyone. And these false charges are what are hanging over him today. Brothers to the Rescue was a group of Cuban right-wing exiles in Miami whose publicly stated mission was helping Cuban rafters in the Florida Straits. But by 1995, the head of Brothers to the Rescue, Jose Basulto, was beginning to resume terrorist plots against Cuba that only those closest to him, including those in the Cuban Five, knew of. And in late 1995, until that shoot-down of February 24th, six months later, a period of several months, Jose Basulto led numerous invasions of Cuban airspace with these planes, even buzzing Havana buildings. This was clearly a threat to the population and was a blatant act intended to provoke a response from Cuba. And then in January, Jose Basulto appeared on Miami television with some of his co-pilots and he boasted that on February 24th, he and his pilots would fly into Cuba because he claimed that was his right. He announced it on television. And Bill Richardson, who was an official in the Clinton administration at the time, went to Cuba twice, weeks before the shoot down. And he gave a personal assurance from President Clinton to the Cuban leadership that the planes would not be allowed to take off on that day. Because Cuba warned, if there are more incursions into our airspace, into our territory, we will take direct action. And then those planes took off. Three planes invaded Cuban airspace, and two of them were shot down by Cuban MiGs. By the way, Jose Basulto filed a false flight plan that morning, and his license was suspended by the FAA, but nothing ever happened to him. It was a full seven months. Oh, I'm sorry. There was no factual basis for charging Gerardo Hernandez with conspiracy to commit premeditated murder within the special maritime U.S. territorial jurisdiction, meaning the U.S. considers that its jurisdiction extends all the way to 12 miles of Cuba's territory. The U.S. prosecutors disputed in the trial saying that the planes were shot down in international waters, but it really doesn't matter where they fell, because the real issue is that Gerardo Hernandez had nothing to do 
with the shootdown. He was charged with having plotted with Cuba, and this is important. He was accused of plotting with Cuba to shoot down the planes illegally in international waters, as if Cuba would consider such a thing. Even the prosecution did not believe that they could convict Gerardo on this charge. The U.S. Attorney appealed to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, seeking a change of instructions to the jury that would enable a conviction against Hernandez. The prosecution said, we have an insurmountable obstacle. We cannot convict. If the judge requires that the jury believe that Gerardo planned for the planes to be shot down in international waters, keep in mind, it's a matter of seconds when a plane is flying whether on which side of a border they would be. And so the U.S. Attorney went to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals to ask the court to order the judge to make the instructions easier to convict. The 11th Circuit denied the request by the attorney, and yet bringing back the case to the trial, this Miami jury, already infected with an enormous hysteria by the Miami media, convicted Gerardo on the murder conspiracy, and the five on all 26 counts. They were sentenced, today they now have collectively 99 years among them and the two life sentences for Gerardo. So, began the appeals. I'll just finish very quickly because we have a full program before us. Um, four years after their conviction, the three-judge panel of the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, after deliberating on the evidence for 27 months in the first step of the appeals, ruled unanimously on August 9, 2005, in a 93-page unprecedented decision that to overturn all the convictions of the five. And they stated that a perfect storm existed in Miami during trial, that it was not possible for them to have a fair trial in that venue of Miami, that the government conducted misconduct, and because of the extensive existence of terrorism in Miami. And yet the Bush administration appealed, and exactly one year later, the full panel, the en banc panel of the 11th Circuit, reinstated the convictions, and that's why the men are still in prison. There have been other appeals since then, Three of them had their sentences reduced. As I said, Antonio and Ramon had their sentences reduced from life, but Gerardo remains with double life. Um, what was not known at the time of the trial, nor in the first step of their appeals, is what we are here about today. And that is that five years after their conviction, a Miami Herald article appeared on September 6, 8, 2006. And this Miami reporter from the Miami Herald had done research on the Freedom of Information Act. And basically, he found that a number of Miami journalists were on the U.S. government payroll, secretly. And so we took that information and filed Freedom of Information Acts with the help of Mara Fahey Hilliard, who will be speaking about that, and have since discovered that dozens of Miami journalists who, in the most hysterical and prejudicial manner, covered the case of the five to convict them in the Miami media from the time of the shootdown all the way through their arrest, their detention, and their trial with absurd lies and unsubstantiated claims while they were on the U.S. government payroll, unknown to the defendants, working for the U.S. propaganda stations, radio and TV RT. I will leave that information there but to ask you to please, when you leave tonight, and I hope you all stay for all the speakers, because they all have something very important to contribute to this case and this cause. Please be sure that you take um, some of the literature at the table. It's all very informative about this case. Sign the petition if you wish. Give us your email if you'd like um, notices and updates on their case. The five have issued a statement of solidarity to you all tonight, and we hope we'll have time that it can be read. Thank you so much. The five will return home with your solidarity. Thank you.